Thank you, Peter and Susan. Well, I know I only started a few months ago, but I think this is about the end of the line. All good things have to come to an end, they say. It's just that I didn't quite expect it to come so quickly. It seems like we just started, but today is the end of the line. Today is the last Sunday of the Christian calendar. It's Christ the King Sunday. We started about this time last year. We started with Advent, Christmas, Epiphany. We moved into Lent, Easter, Pentecost. And then we went through this long series of um, ordinary time. We have gone full circle in our Christian calendar. And we've come to the end of the line, Christ the King Sunday. The question for us is, is this our finish line? Or could this possibly be a new beginning? I don't think we know yet. I don't think we quite know. For those of you who know, this will be a repeat, but there, I'm sure, are a number of people here that may not know this. And I'll give you a short primer. A lot of churches, ours included, tends to kind of focus on this Christian calendar of the year. We go through these seasons, and in these seasons, we, we talk about different phases of Christ's life, right? Like for Advent, we're waiting for God's intervention in our world. We, we await the coming of the new Messiah. We celebrate at Christmas time the reality of his presence in our lives. And, and then in Epiphany, we, we, we think and talk about what that really concretely means for us in our lives. And then, of course, in Lent and preparing ourselves and the walk to the cross that Jesus took and this crucifixion and resurrection and, and all of this. And then we spend 33 weeks in ordinary time, a time talking about what it means for our discipleship. We focus as we go around this, and you know, some of you have come up to me and say, Jim, how do you, how do you know uh, what scriptures to use on Sunday? And I'll say, well, this is kind of how it goes for me. There's no set way you have to do it. But tied to these seasons in the Christian calendar, there are given um, scriptures called the lectionary. And out of the lectionary, a lot of clergy take their passages for Sunday's message. Well, around here, we kind of stick to that too. But we're free if uh, the, the minister wants to be rebellious. You can be rebellious, and you can pick a different, a different scripture if you wanted. You thought there was something more relevant, more pressing that needed to be talked about. You can do that. So we kind of generally stay with that. But we're free to um, take a little latitude as well. One thing I've noticed about you around here is you like celebrating the movement of time. You like celebrating birthdays around here, don't we? We have a lot of cake out in the narthex celebrating your birthdays. We like celebrating anniversaries and special moments of our church. Some people like talking 
about the movement of time, how old John Seath is. He's 95. I was with one of our members this week, Dave Johnson, who's 98. Um, some of you like talking about how old the church is. Some like talking about how long the, the interim minister's been around, and others want to talk about how long until he's gone. You know, we're just kind of focused on this. We're just focused on time. And maybe that's because we're tied to this in this, this annual season of the circle. There was this Catholic church, and they were coming up on the 25th anniversary of the installation of their priest. And they, they thought this was a very important marker of time, and, and they wanted to celebrate it. So they had planned, and they had a social committee like we do, and, and, and they planned for a dinner and for some speech, and, and they just really wanted to mark this and say thank you. So they had a, they had a, a person who was a local politician, and he was very good at giving speeches. And so they asked him if he would say something uh, to the congregation at this great event. And he said, of course he would. So the evening rolled around, and um, all of a sudden the phone rang. They were having dinner, and, and the politician was on the end of the line. And he said, I'm going to be a little late. I'm so sorry, but I'm stuck in traffic, and there's nothing I can do about it. The, the, the priest was on the other end, and he said, well, don't worry about it. <clears throat> he said, I'll say a few words until you get there, and then you can, you can start your speech. And the politician just absolutely said, count on me. I'll be there not to worry. I'm just going to be a little late. So they had dinner, and the priest looking at his watch, and it was time for the speech, and... The politician wasn't there, so he, the priest stood up and just was going to share a few words. And he said, you know, I remember, I remember um, my first day that I arrived here at the church. Um, now, I have to tell you, the seal of the confessional can never be broken, right? He said, but I, I want to give you a little general sense of what I was experiencing. He said, I was, I was in the church the first day, and this person, this member of our church, came in for confession. And <clears throat> I listened to this, and I thought, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? He said, this, this, this man started confessing that he had stolen some electronics, and as he was making his getaway, he was pulled over by the police, and he got into a scuffle with the police. And they arrested him, took him down to the station, where they, they realized that he was, uh, he was being sought out because he had stolen money from his parents as well as extortion with, with his business, and, um, and, and he actually had gotten involved in, in illegal drugs. And the, and the priest said to the dinner crowd, he said, I just couldn't believe what I had gotten myself into and where my church was. He said, I, I couldn't believe that this was our church. As he was speaking, the door flung open and the politician came running in. He was huffing and puffing and, and he said, I'm, I'm sorry. He started apologizing all over the place. He said, I'm so sorry. I got stuck in traffic. I couldn't make it, but let me, let me just get on with the speech. He said, I remember the first day that, that, I, uh, that our priest arrived. And uh, as a matter of fact, I, I had the honor of being the first one to go to him for confession. <laughs> you see, sometimes it's good to look back, right? It's good to look back and to remember. And, and we will do that as a church in transition, right? We're looking back and we're saying... These are really pillars of our church. This, these are the things and the values, the, the experiences that we want to build our church upon. These are who we are. And so we do that. 
And we look ahead and we say, well, you know, we've taken some time and we've been thinking about our ministry and our identity and these are the things we need to shore up. And I hope that you're telling your search committee about these things so they know as we go through the process of finding our next settled minister, they'll know what is important to you. You see, these are where the finish lines, like when Mark left, that, that we can celebrate what was really powerful and good about Mark's ministry. We want, there are things we want to hold to. There are other things God may be calling us to do in our next chapter of ministry, and we want to make sure that our search committee knows about those things too. You see, that's where finish lines can become lifelines. That's where that ending can become a new beginning. Not always. Not always but sometimes. But a lot of it depends upon what we do. Maybe not like the priest and the politician, but, you know, what we do with our finished lines. When we cross a line, are we able to reflect personally? Are we able to say, am I following Christ in a faithful way? Am I, am I being the kind of person that he calls me to be? Am I growing spiritually? And how about as a church? How about as United Church of Marco Island? Are we fulfilling our mandate, our calling? Are we shining the light of Christ into our community and beyond? Are we seeing as a church of caring, faithful people, that those who are lost and alone can come and find community? These are questions when we pass our finish lines that are worth entertaining. You don't know this about me, but I used to be a runner, not much of a runner, no, not much of a runner. But up in Wisconsin, I used to run every day for years. That's why I can barely walk now. <laughs> but I ran, I ran every single day, uh, whether it was five below or 105. I ran through the sun, the snow, the sleet, the ice. I just loved running. And then when I would travel, I would always make it a, an adventure for myself to, to go run whatever site was there, run the Grand Canyon, maybe Central Park, the Alamo, the Space Needle in Seattle. It was just added to the fun of it all. I mentioned that I wasn't much of a runner, right? But maybe that's why I was so interested in what happened in 1982 in New York City. Ronald Reagan was in the White House. And he had invited the winners of the New York City Marathon to the Oval Office. <clears throat> he wanted to honor their their feet, their athletic uh, victory. And so he invited Alberto Salazar, who ran the 26.2 miles in two hours and nine minutes. Who does that? <laughs> and he invited Greta, uh, uh, Greta Weitz, who had run it in two hours and 27 minutes to win the women's division. Spectacular event, right? Spectacular victories. But there was another person, another athlete in the Oval Office that day that I had to come and tell you about. Her name was Linda Down. 
Linda finished the race, the 26.2 miles, in 11 hours, 57 seconds. And she may well have been the most outstanding, remarkable athlete in the Oval Office that day. You see, Linda was born with cerebral palsy. It was a debilitating disease that had affected her ability to walk. And in fact, she walked with aluminum crutches, the kind that come up over your forearm, you know. And that's how she walked. But Linda had an idea, you see, that she she wanted to run the New York City Marathon. And she thought that she could because she had been hearing in her church about this verse that Ian read, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And she thought that applied to her. So she trained. She practiced. And the day came, New York City Marathon. Thousands of people were gathered. It's the one thing that runners really hate. It was a windy day. And the race started uphill as it approached the Verrazano Narrows Bridge in Staten Island. Linda was wearing gloves on her hands to soften the blow on the handles on her crutches. And as they began the race, as I said, it was uphill, it was cold, and it was windy. As she crossed the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, it was at the first mile marker, and she could see nobody out in front of her. She could see no other runners as she pressed on. She pressed on and around, oh, I don't know, um, maybe about the four or five mile marker, um, she had seen that the city workers had all disassembled the barricades and the streets were open again. And so she found herself only able to run on the sidewalk around people, but run, run she did. She worried that as night was approaching and it was going to be dark, that things might get a little dicey for her. But she kept saying to herself, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It was kind of like a miracle, she said, that at the 10-mile mark, an ABC crew came up alongside her and asked if they could accompany her to the finish line, and she said yes, and she kept running. As she ran, she wore a hole in her running shoe from dragging it on the ground. Her arms were black and blue and swollen. It was getting dark. And she pressed on. A little bit further on. Parks and Recreation pickup truck came by. It was by that time night, and it was dark, and they turned their headlights on and lit the way for Linda to finish her race. As she crossed her 26.2 miles, Seemed like everybody was crying. The ABC crew was crying. The Parks and Recreation people were crying. Linda was crying and praying. 
her favorite prayer, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I get goosebumps and I get choked up telling you that story. She truly was the most remarkable athlete in the Oval Office that day. And that's not to take anything away from Salazar and Weitz. So I have one question for you. Just one question today. As we come to today, is this our finish line? Or is this perhaps for our church a new beginning? I know some of you thought when Mark left it was a finish line. You thought we're never going to be okay again. I understand why. What a lovely, tremendous minister. We found that there's a new chapter God calls us to. We have to grieve our losses, I get that. But maybe there's something about that circle. Maybe there's something about the seasons that Christ keeps reminding us that life is full of finish lines and starting lines. Not to take anything away from the darkness and the sadness of finish lines but maybe we can rise and begin anew. And we're going to do that as a church in transition. You've guaranteed me that'll happen. I know you'll be a part of that. God bless you. God bless you in your race. And God bless you as members of United Church of Marco Island to cheer us all on.